Welcome back to the 99, where we are focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, and this is week two of Commander Legends previews. As a matter of fact, the whole set has been spoiled at this point. So if you want to get my opinions on the week one preview cards, well, visit the episode that says Commander Legends week one. I'll be discussing new cards that were announced for the set, and of course, these two videos will encompass the entire set. So if you want to get my firm opinion, all the dirty deets on all the cards recently announced, well, check out both videos. You can watch them in any order. It doesn't matter. One thing to note, though, when you're rolling through these videos, this is a CDH channel, so expect the perspective of a competitive commander player. Also note that I'm not going to be discussing any sort of reprints from this set, just new cards that you and I will enjoy in our games of commander. Now, there was one card I just want to start this video off with that I missed that Thursday because it was literally announced after I was done filming. And if you remember correctly, I had to go on a trip that weekend, so I had no time to film this prior. And it was really the only thing that was announced that I missed that was like urgently viable in the game that needed to be discussed. And I might actually leave a link to a video from a different content creator, Rudy, on this very card because there's a lot of hysteria centered around Jeweled Lotus. Now, <laughs> so many people in the comments of that last video were like, Je Jeweled Lotus, how did you miss Jeweled Lotus? You didn't even notice Jeweled Lotus. It was mentioned in the video if you watched all the way to the end. So don't look like a fool. Don't look like a fool. Jeweled Lotus, as the name would suggest, zero CMC, artifact, tap, sacrifice Jeweled Lotus, add three mana of any one color. Stop, stop. Well, I would really love it if it stopped there, but spend this mana only to cast your commander. Now, this card, I'm just gonna preface this by saying this card, not a mana crypt. Not as good as a mana crypt, not nearly close to being a mana crypt mana crypt better card mana crypt around 80 bucks right now this card 120 bucks i saw people buying it for 140 bucks the extended version i mean pre-orders because this set's not even out yet pre-orders on the extended version 240 and up what there's absolute madness around this card because they used a catchword lotus and they made the effect very similar to mtg's most expensive card if i'm not mistaken that was mass produced black lotus this is Black Lotus for Commanders. Really interesting design, guys. Is it a good card? Yes. I'm gonna cover all the bases here. Financially speaking, don't buy this yet. Okay, all these vendors, all these people selling singles uh, on pre-order, they're preying on your fear of missing out. They are preying on that FOMO. They know that folks are gonna throw money at this card because it is the catch mythic rare from the set. Like this is this is the card that is gonna to wanna to go into every single constructed list that is mono or dual colored. I really don't recommend this for those trip four or five colored lists unless your commander happens to be in one color and has the pips in their rules text. We'll get to that in a second. This card, really good. Not over $100, not over $80. I honestly think this card deserves to rest at around 60 to $40 for a non-foil standard version. This is not a Mana Crypt. I remember buying Mana Crypt for $200 and thinking that was a fair price. And every time I use an Enlightened Tutor, I always go for Mana Crypt. Like anytime anyone tutors, if it's within the first or second turn, it's usually Mana Crypt. Because that card's good. It is highly more valuable than this card. Because if I were to draw this at the beginning of my turn or have a hand that started with this card, it's fantastic if it allows me to push my commander out that much sooner. You can have a commander that has four CMC cost out on turn one, that's so cool. And some list, you might even be able to turbo, turbo out that combo, turbo out that sweet, sweet combo. Not every list, but certain lists that rely on their commanders, which is generally those mono or dual colored list or split cost list like Ward. The list that rely on their commanders as a core part of their strategy. If you're just using commanders for pure value, then Jeweled Lotus isn't gonna be great for you. It's not a huge boon, but those monocolored lists like Godo, Savala, they're gonna enjoy this so much because they get to power out their core strategy immediately. However, mid to late game, drawing this, this feels like shit. This is a shit card. If I already have my commander out, this is a useless card. It's really great for starting off your game, it's really good if you mulligan into it and you know that your commander is a core part of the strategy, but elsewise, not that great a card. 
That might be unpopular opinion. But folks were asking me my opinion on this. It's okay. Am I gonna slam it in all of my monocolored lists? Of course. Tiny Bones? He's two CMC, Pat. Yeah, I don't care. This says three mana of any one color. Triple black, let the other one float. Does not matter. There's no more mana burn. Okay, unless I'm playing against your lock. And it's doubtful your lock would have been pumped out quicker than Tiny Bones with this. I highly recommend you play this in a mono or dual colored list. It is a boon for those lists. Turn one Najila, that is okay. You know, of course, like people value that. You're pumping out creatures, you're dealing damage, and you have your combo piece on board should you be relying on those combos. However, by and by, it's not a game-breaking card that deserves to be over $100. It's a very good card, and I think the prices are gonna settle down. So you settle down, don't buy it for $140. Wait until it's $40 and reasonable. Wait till more packs are opened, more of these are in the market, usually like a week after the set releases. That's usually the best time to buy. It depends. Like if it's a box topper promo exclusive art, maybe it's better to pre-order, right? Like if it's a masterpiece, you're not expecting many of them, but at the rate Watsy's putting out special cards, nothing really feels special anymore. So Lotus, or Jeweled Lotus rather, excellent card. Slam it and list that need it. Don't slam it in every list. Uh, and you should be able to discern what list needed. And obviously your wallet is gonna help you discern that as well. Anyway, before we jump into this video, uh, if you value my opinions on this channel, the best way to help support this channel is via Patreon. And as my Patreon members know, there are special benefits for our Brew Crew and Brew Baby members. But the Brew Crew in particular get to have their opinions voiced at the very end of this video regarding our weekly topic. And that topic is, do you feel casual and competitive should have separate ban list? Tune into last month's video where I share my thoughts on this very topic, but expect a random Brew Crew member's thoughts on the topic during our end roll. And if you want your name on that end roll, there's only one way to get there via Patreon. Now, I'm going to go over Commander Legends in Wooberg order. And I should just say uh, Uberg order because there isn't a damn thing for white. In case you're wondering why you're using bias lighting in the background, that's because uh, th these lights are in memoriam for white. White died today. White is clearly dead with this set. They don't know how to design for white in Commander, and it's very evident with this set. The effects we're seeing are decent in a draft environment, but in a constructed game, eternal format like Commander, uh, the, these are just shitty, shitty cards. There are some shitty white cards. They're passing all of white's effects off to other colors anyway, so, you know, I don't even know why white's, there should just be four colors in in, in Magic at this point. White is uh, is dying in Commander, and I would think that the only, the set that was geared towards Commander would at least have one good card. No. The court is decent, but we talked about that last week. Nothing this week. Moving on. In blue. Okay, so there's a couple of cards to discuss in blue. And the first one I want to talk about, speaking of effects that White got, uh, that now just exist in blue. Hull Breacher. And when this card was announced, it was a thought that there would be a cycle of two generic, one color, the given color of that part of the color pie, flash hate bears, flash bears. Now they stopped at opposition agent and hull breacher. So for two generic, one blue creature, merfolk pirate, three, two body, they're, they're mirror images of each other, flash. If an opponent would draw a card except for the first one they draw each of their draw steps, instead you create a treasure token. Now this sounds very similar to another card, and there's actually a meme of Hull Breacher with the art of the previous card smothering Tithe on it. I, if I can find it, I'll put it on the screen for you. It's really good. Woo! What? <laughs> what is this card? So smothering Tithe, um, it still lets your opponents draw. But if they don't pay a tax of two, uh, the owner of Smothering Tithe gets to create. The controller of Smothering Tithe, subsequently its owner, gets to make a treasure. So this is Smothering Tithe with Flash for one CMC less on a 3-2 body that doesn't let you draw. You don't, there's no tax here. There's no cute, I, I can pay it off and not give you a treasure and still draw a card, no. 
This just says you don't draw a card. Now, why, why is this good? Why is this viable in CDH? Well, there are effects called wheels that are commonly played in a competitive uh, level of Commander that uh, we see all the time. Time Twister, Wheel of Fortune, it can even go all the way down to Windfall, Dark Deal. There's a lot of dumb wheels that just exist in the game. And this is abusing every single one of them. So if I were to cast Hull Breacher and I were to cast the most recent wheel, Wheel of Misfortune, uh, you don't want to let go of your hand. Maybe not that card. Let's just say Wheel of Fortune. If I cast Wheel of Fortune, you discard your hand, and then if you would draw, no. No. I'm going to make seven treasures, seven treasures, seven treasures. Because I played a card that was two generic and one blue. With that wheel. How sweet is that? It's really good, because when you draw seven new cards, shit, you got a ton of mana to play out all those cards. This is a, a very good effect. It should be in any mid-range list that contains blue, it should be slammed. This is a auto-include, this is a must-buy from the set, it is the best blue card from the set. Hull Breacher. Breaching Tithe. It's just, a, it's just, why wasn't this white? I don't understand why they couldn't give white a decent hate bear in this set, and that what it's emblematic for, white's ability to stacks out a board, uh, two effects were granted to black and blue instead. Demir, really getting loved this set. And arguably the coolest multicolored commander is also Demir from this set. Holy shit, Hall Breacher. Oh god. If it, again, if it was a generic and double blue, maybe not as playable, but it is so splashable. I'm gonna try to move on. Oh my god. How do you guys feel about Hull Breacher? Let me know in the comment section down below. Does it does it bother you as much as it bothers me? Um, obviously, if wheels aren't abundant in your format, then who gives a shit? But this stops any ability that lets you draw. I'm gonna try to move on. <laughs> Body of Knowledge. For three generic and double blue. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna mention this because it combos uh, with a is it commander that I really like? Two, actually. Creature avatar, star star, body. Oh, what? Body of knowledge's power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards in your hand. So if you have four, it's a four, four. If you have five, it's a five, five, so on and so forth. You have no maximum hand size. Cool, cool. So I can have an indefinite amount of cards. Whenever body of knowledge is dealt damage, draw that many cards. Um, if I were to ever brew for blue, if you don't watch this channel, I don't construct blue list. Uh, I've always wanted to do a niv mizzet Perun, 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 or uh, the Firemind. They're both really cool uh, commanders, specifically Perun. So I'll go ahead and read that off now. It's triple blue, triple red, legendary creature, dragon wizard, 5-5 five, five body. The spell can't be countered, flying. Whenever you draw a card, niv mizzet Perun deals one damage to any target. Whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery, you draw a card. Well, that player can be you. And should you cast, it doesn't matter, Gataxian Probe. When you cast Gataxian Probe, guess what? You've, you've put the trigger on the stack, you draw the card, you get to damage a thing. What are you gonna damage? I'm gonna damage Body of Knowledge. Body of Knowledge trigger. When Body of Knowledge is dealt damage, draw that many cards. I'll draw one. And it scales the defense. So you're never going to damage Body of Knowledge out. Let's just say I had four cards in my hand when I started this chain of events. It's even easier with Firemind because Firemind can tap and draw a card, right? You can just start the chain that way in case you don't know what Firemind does. They both combo with this card. Four cards in hand, deal one damage. Whoop! Five cards in hand, have one damage on this creature. So virtually, I'm always going to escape death unless someone were to bolt it or hit it with something to kill it in the middle of this, you know, drawing fiasco. But if you couldn't tell already, it will it cause a chain reaction. I, I draw a card off Body of Knowledge. I get to do one damage to any target. I do one damage to Body of Knowledge. I keep drawing. I draw through my deck. You should be able to win at this point. I don't know if you can't. There's there are other issues with your list. But Niv Mizzet Perun Perun or the Fire Mind get to combo with Body of Knowledge. And of course, you don't need to do an infinite, and that's near infinite. You don't want to go infinite with that. You would lose the game. You can obviously combo out with this card other ways, but a two-card combo is pretty powerful in CDH, so Body of Knowledge, definitely noteworthy. 
uh, just on that alone, I think if you play either of those Niv-Mizzets, you're going to want to run Body of Knowledge. <laughs> Very good card. And of course, you could just damage this thing yourself to draw, you know, on your turn. Um, and you can use that secretly to, like, damage out the board. If, if this alone by itself, if it's not summoning sick and you've drawn, like, 20 cards that turn, you can really swing at someone and hurt them. So even casually, fun times. I think Body of Knowledge is really sweet. Probably my favorite blue card outside of Hull Breacher. Obviously, Hull Breacher is, like, the, the best thing from this set for blue. Now, I want to move on to black here. I... Uh, <sighs> Don't, I've tried to brew for this and I'm not, I wish it was better, but Nadir, Agent of the Duskinel. Damn, things are expensive at Duskinel because it's five generic, one black to cast this partner, legendary creature, elf, warrior, three, three body. Uh, this is one of the uncommon commanders, but one of the more interesting ones in my book. So whenever a token you control leaves the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on Nadir, Agent of the Duskinel. When Nadir leaves the battlefield, create a number of 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens equal to its power. Partner. Man, it makes green elf warrior creatures, yet it's black. And there's a reason why they've omitted this from being a green partner. Because one, green couldn't get a decent partner in this set. And two, it combos with food chain. It does. It does. Trust me. So if I were going to use food chain... Exile Nadir, I get six plus the one from Food Chain, and then I make one one bodies equal to its power. So I'll make three creatures once uh, Nadir leaves the battlefield. I can sacrifice one of those to Food Chain, cast Nadir again. Oh, holy shit. Wait, what is this? I can kill those, put plus one plus one counters on Nadir, sacrifice it, and make five more of those. And I can keep sacrificing one creature to consequently pump out Nadir. Right? Yeah, I think that's how that works. And I'll leave Food Chain on the screen so you can check it out. Uh, it's an old combo card, but a goodie. When you exile the creature, unfortunately, that mana can only go towards casting creature spells. So you can't pair this with something like Thrasios and get uh, blue, green, obviously Food Chain, and use that mana to pump into Thrasios because the activated ability in Thrasios is not the same as casting Thrasios. Unfortunately, there's really no outlet in the command zone you can utilize infinite creature casting mana with outside of Nadir, who's making those tokens. So yes, you can make, you know, an army of 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature tokens, but then the issue there is that you need something to do with those creature tokens. So you would need another sack outlet on board that does damage or mills people or simply have something that enables haste on your board, like a Concordant Crossroads. You happen to be in green, so maybe you'll have that out. But outside of giving these creatures haste, Concordant Crossroads is probably not gonna be great in this list. So I'm iffy on Nadir. Not, not, not high on the Nadir partner pairing, but there is another uncommon in black. Miara, Thorn of the Glade. One generic, one black, uncommon body. 1-2 Bude, an legendary creature elf scout. Whenever Mayara, Thorn of the Glade, or another elf you control dies, you may pay one and a life. If you do, draw a card. That's pretty good. I mean, that's kind of, uh, you can do, if you, if, can you hear that outside? Sorry, there's like a parade of people driving by, and there's also construction. So if you can hear all of that, I'm sorry. If you did a food, I guess you could do food chain again. You could go, go with your Thrasios and Mayara. Let's just say you actually do that. Let's try to make Mayara work. I like this because it is draw on a commander. Draw is very good. Draw is always good. So if you did food chain, um, some food chain loop, and you had food chain Mayara, and a way to generate mana elsewise like you can convert your creature casting you have ashnod's altar or phyrexian altar fine so you did the thrasios pairing you did the food chain mana with your miss hollow griffin and you've made infinite creature mana you cast myara and then you use ashnod's altar to sacrifice her and then you can use one of the two generic to go ahead and pay one to draw a card but i mean if you're doing that you could just use the generic on thrasios Ugh. Both my mono black partners are failing me. If the if, if you've come up with something for Mayara that is clearly better than what I've just established there, let me know in the comment section if you're brewing for Mayara 
again, anytime you see draw in the command zone, it's always a good thing, but sometimes it's not as easily enabled. <laughs> you can do what I just suggested, but there's probably better things to do with Thrasios. Um, but yeah, there you go. And, and just including the black gives you tutors. So, you know, getting to food chains easier. Not that this is a food chain <laughs> commander like Nadir is. Now uh, we're gonna move on to red and red, arguably the most favored color from the set. It definitely got the most stuff, the most goodies. And this is a card I really wanna brew for because it's very interesting in concept. It's a, it's a combo enabler and I'll talk through two combos with you concerning Hellkite Courser. So for four generic double red, creature dragon mythic rare, this 6-5 body with flying allows you to what? When Hellkite Courser enters the battlefield, you may put a commander you own from the command zone onto the battlefield. What? And it gains haste, return it to the command zone at the beginning of the next end step. So I like infinite things on this channel. I like to do infinite things. I'm sure there's other shenanigans to be had here. But let's just say you cast Hellkite Courser and your commander happens to be Gerard Weatherlight Hero. So Gerard Weatherlight Hero for two generic, one red, one white, so you're in Boros. Legendary creature, human soldier, 3-3 three, three body, first strike. When Gerard Weatherlight Hero dies, exile it and return to the battlefield all artifact and creature cards in your graveyard that were put there from the battlefield of this turn. So if you happen to have a sack outlet, let's just say Blasting Station. We'll use Blasting Station for both of these combos I'll be mentioning. Uh, and I'll paraphrase Blasting Station. It's an artifact at three CMC that allows you to tap it, sacrifice a creature, and deal one damage to any target. It also has a second ability, should be on the screen, that's triggered whenever a creature enters the battlefield, you can untap it. So if I were gonna go with this combo, I'll cast Hellkite Courser. Hellkite comes into play. It's a trigger is on the stack. I'm gonna go ahead and let that resolve, get Gerard to enter the battlefield. When Gerard enters the battlefield, there's gonna be a new trigger for our blasting station that's also in play to untap it. It's currently untapped. So I'll go ahead and tap it, tapping it to sacrifice the Hellkite Courser and deal one damage to one of my opponents, one of their creatures. It doesn't matter. We're gonna to try to do this infinitely. Now Gerard will resolve uh, the untap trigger on that blasting station having entered, allowing it to untap. And now I can actually sacrifice Gerard, put him back into the command zone. Because if Gerard is the captain, <laughs> Gerard is the captain, if Gerard's your commander, uh, it doesn't matter whether it stays in exile or as a replacement effect goes to the command zone, it still resolves the last effect, that triggered ability. So when Gerard goes back to your command zone, we'll return all creatures and artifacts from our graveyard uh, that were put there from the battlefield this turn. Well, Courser was put there from the battlefield this turn. Enters the battlefield, trigger on the stack. We get to untap Blasting Station. We also get to put Gerard back into play. You see what's going on here? Infinite shenanigans. Yeah, there's ways to interact with this. Simply destroying the Blasting Station is enough, but it's a really cool three card combo that's automatically enabled should you resolve Hellkite Courser or put it on the battlefield somehow. And there are other ways to put creatures on the battlefield in red. You know, sneak attack, you have transmogrify, you have other ways to put creatures on the battlefield. But it, it gets even better, in my opinion, in Rakdos. And you can do the same thing with Hellkite with Bladewing the Risen. So for three generic, double black, double red, creature dragon legend, and I'm gonna put the Scourge art up because hell yeah, do I want an old school foil Scourge Bladewing the Risen in the command zone. Flying, 4-4 four, four body, when Bladewing the Risen comes into play, you may return target dragon from your graveyard to play. Last effect, who gives a shit? It's Rakdos, all dragons get plus one, plus one until the end of turn. We don't care about that. We care about that ETB. Now this is a little bit different than Gerard because this is a targeted effect. So Hellkite needs to be in the graveyard for this to work. So how this will work, if we're using Blasting Station again, assuming Blasting Station's on the field, we get Hellkite onto the battlefield, triggered ability on the stack. Blasting Station this time around is actually gonna sacrifice the Hellkite, right? To put it in our grave before the triggered ability resolves. Now whether or not Hellkite Courser is on the field or not is irrelevant at this point. Triggered ability is already put on the sack, so unless someone stifles it, it's gonna resolve. It will resolve, getting Bladewing the Risen from our command zone onto the battlefield. It's gonna see the dragon in our graveyard and return that dragon to the battlefield. 
Well, that triggers on the stack. We can actually stack the Blasting Station untap trigger and the Blade Wing the Risen trigger however we choose. And it's always first in, last out. So we'll do Blade Wing the Risen trigger and then untap Blasting Station trigger. Untap our Blasting Station, kill Blade Wing the Risen, put it back on our command zone. Return Hellkite. Again, a little different than Gerard. It's a variation of the same thing. It's just timing with Blasting Station. And of course, you can do this with anything. I mean, you're in red, so you also have Goblin Bombardment. You can use things like Altar of Dementia. If you want to use this to make infinite mana for some reason, you can use Phyrexian Altar. Any of the altars that sacrifice things to do things. You're, you're going to be in a good place. I really like this card. I, I want to brew a list for this card specifically, and this particular card actually encouraged me to brew a specific list for this set that exists in Mardu which we'll talk about on the channel, but it doesn't include Hellkite Courser. Do expect me to brew a list with Hellkite Courser. It's going to be a mid-range combo list that works to much the same effect. I think that Gerard is probably my commander of choice because I like punishing myself by playing the weakest color in Magic. But it could be good. We'll see. Although Bladewing the Risen, I gotta say. Super tempted to just use Bladewing and you know, some form of strategy to pump out Hellkite as quickly as possible. Moving on, again, red got a lot, and this is another combo card in red, and I'll try to work through this combo a little bit quicker. Coercive Recruiter. Four generic, one red, four three body, creature, orc, pirate, or at rare. Whenever Coercive Recruiter or another pirate enters the battlefield under your control, gain control of target creature until end of turn. It can be anyone's creature. Untap that creature. Until the end of turn, it gains haste and becomes a pirate in addition to its other types. Uh, the, mm, yeah, there's probably something there with that, but um, this is a Kiki combo card. Kiki Jiki combo card. So, Coercive Recruiter enters the battlefield. You know, you can trigger on the stack, use Kiki Jiki, make a new one, or you could just wait, doesn't matter. Gain control of some other creature that's valuable to you. Whatever. If you use Kiki Jiki to create a copy of this, you'll continue to do this and have infinite hasty 4-3 bodies. What's also, and, and the only reason I'm mentioning this, because there were two Kiki cards that were printed for this set. I mentioned the other one in our last review. It also allows you to make infinite copies of something like Dockside Extortionist. Because Dockside Extortionist is a pirate, if I already use Kiki Jiki to create a token copy of Dockside Extortionist, it will enter, trigger a course of recruiter, and allow me to gain control of Kiki Jiki again. So beyond having infinite hasty Dockside Extortionist, and let's just say for some reason someone's using some sort of prison stacks piece that doesn't allow you to attack into them, you can at least use one of your other value pirates and every red list should be running Dockside Extortionist to make infinite mana, right? Again, this is in the off chance you for some reason can't swing and kill your opponent. Then you can make infinite mana with Dockside Extortionist. So, there are other things to do with this that are actually very valuable and very potent. So, you know, obviously making infinite mana in Commander is pretty good, as we've learned. Uh, now, I do want to mention one card that I'm not high on, but everyone's discussing it. I know the boys like it. I'm not, I'm not a fan of this card at all. It's a lesser Wheel of Fortune, and it is called Wheel of Misfortune for two generic and one red. Let me just start by saying Wheel of Fortune is on the reserve list. And the last one I bought, I, th I think I bought for like 35 or 40 bucks. It's over $100 now, easily, for the revised edition. They're very expensive to pick up, and it's one of those staple cards in Commander. It's a very, very good card. This is a decent alternative, okay? Not to shit on this card. But it is a lesser Wheel of Fortune, don't be mistaken. So for two generic, one red sorcery, each player secretly chooses a number zero or greater Then all players reveal those numbers simultaneously and determine the highest and lowest numbers revealed this way. I'm gonna stop there. I hate cards that make me do things outside of the regular actions of the game. I don't want to take my phone and secretly record a number. I don't want to have a pen or notepad or a dry erase to, this is not of interest to me. You're making me do something I really don't care to do. <laughs> Wheel of Misfortune deals damage equal to the highest number to each player who chose that number. So if we all chose 8, we all take 8. If Benny chose 8, we all chose something else, then only Benny takes 8. 
Each player who didn't choose the lowest number discards their hand, then draws seven cards. So why this allows you to choose zero is this instance. If you have five cards in your hand and it's a combo enabling hand, you're not gonna wanna discard these cards. So you could choose zero and, you know, run the not run the risk of losing life and two keep your hand you can maintain your hand by having the lowest number nothing's lower than zero here obviously that's a, a scenario that you might run into so this is a really cool wheel because it's avoidable this is not like wheel of fortune that is disruption you can avoid the disruption if you mulligan to that perfect hand wheel of misfortune is not going to make you lose that perfect hand so that's really cool. Now, when you're looking at this card and you're like, well, how secret of a number can I choose? Well, it's gonna stay in the double digits and it's gonna remain 39 or under because you don't want it, you don't want to kill yourself casting this card, okay? You can say 40 and win while simultaneously losing. Maybe there's some politics to this. Maybe it's more interesting than I'm assuming, but here's the thing, if you, each player who didn't choose the lowest number discards their hand, then draws seven cards. So if you're all tied, if you all said seven, you all have the highest number, you all take seven damage. It's, I don't think you draw any cards. Am I wrong? If you all said seven, each player who didn't choose the lowest number discards their hand, then draws seven cards. You're technically, I don't know, I guess I'll have to wait for the official ruling, but to me, if you all had the same number chosen, then that's the misfortunate part, right? I don't know. I'm not high on this card. If you like it, if you're going to run it, uh, go for it. It's, it's another wheel, kind of. It's not Wheel of Fortune, though. All right, last red card I want to talk about, only because I've discussed the previous courts, I'm going to talk about the courts from this set, and as a matter of fact, it's... The green court's the only green card I'm going to mention. Because I want to cover the cycle. Court of Ire, three generic, double red, enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, Court of Ire deals two damage to any target. If you happen to be the monarch, it deals seven damage to that player or permanent instead. Hold your tongue lest you burn it. So, is this card good? Not at five CMC. <laughs> Why five CMC? Why five for this? If you, okay, so if you have a commander, and I'm gonna say this for every court, if you have a commander that allows you to maintain the monarchy, then of course this is very good, because this is one card draw and then two removal, because it lets you hit any target. And also seven damage every upkeep is pretty solid, but for five, this didn't need to be five. This could be four CMC, like the other ones outside of the blue one that happens to be three, and still be very potent. Look, you're just putting a target on your head when you cast this. So whether it was 2 CMC or 5 CMC, people are going to want to remove it. Why are you making it so difficult for the red player? Okay, their rituals aren't that good. Desperate ritual for this still feels really bad. It's an okay card. And moving on to green. This set should have seen a reprint of Allosaurus Shepherd, by the way. I mean, Jumpstart wasn't necessarily a commander set, but commander players care about Allosaurus Shepherd. I would have rather seen that than three visits or fine horn elves. But we did get cool reprints in green, a lot of shitty ass cards in this. Court of Bounty. Two generic double green enchantment. When Court of Bounty enters the battlefield, guess what? You become the monarch. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. If you're the monarch, however, instead you may put a creature or land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Obviously, one of those holds more value. Dropping your Cascade, 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 Cascade card, whatever the new Leviathan Titan thing is. Um, I guess it wouldn't be a Leviathan. Whatever the green card is, that monstrosity that cascades a shit ton, you could just drop that on the field. There have been variations of this type of effect um, over the past sets of MTG, but this is the newest iteration and it gives you card draw. So despite what people commonly believe, green doesn't have that much card draw. So having more of it is actually really nice, you know, especially because it's not dependent on creature power, any of that shit. That's usually how green gets draw outside of harmonize, but no one's running harmonize in CDH. Court of Bounty, giving you Monarch, really cool. Putting creatures from your hand onto the battlefield, really cool. I think that you would need 
a certain amount of creatures to be at that threshold for this to be viable. But because it lets you put creatures on the battlefield at the beginning of your upkeep, if you've maintained monarchy as a full cycle goes around and it's your turn again, you get to put creatures down that could potentially protect Court of Bounty. Court of Bounty. I do like it. I, I think it's one of the more interesting courts. I still think the white one is the best because white needs draw desperately and it generates bodies to protect that particular court. So this one's just okay. I wanted to mention at least one green card. <laughs> there was nothing, arguably nothing to mention for white though, so I didn't. Now uh, we're moving on to multicolored cards and there's only so many cards left to discuss. This is easily the most interesting, I hate saying it, this is easily the most interesting multicolored commander from this set and it happens to be in Demir, right? So you already know what this game plan is gonna be. Before we even read the stats of this card, you already know what Demir wants to do in Commander, in CDH in particular, it wants to cast him on a consultation in Thassa's Oracle. That's all Demir wants to do, right? So this is a really interesting way of getting to that condition, and it is Arami of the Dead Tide. For one generic, one blue, one black, one four body, uncommon, legendary creature, merfolk, wizard, tap it, exile cards from your graveyard equal to the number of opponents you have, target creature card in your graveyard gains Encore until the end of turn. The Encore cost is equal to its mana cost. So if you don't know what Encore is, I'm just going to read off the text here. Exile the creature card and pay its mana cost. For each opponent, you create a token copy that attacks that opponent this turn if able. Don't really care about that aspect. They gain haste. Sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. Activate this ability uh, only as a sorcery. So that is a little bit of a limitation. You're not able to use this off turn to effectively win on someone else's turn, but that seems fair for what you're doing. You're creating three token copies of a particular card. So I'm not on the Discord for Arami. I don't really give a shit how this gets to Thassa's Oracle, but if I'm gonna think about it, the first thing that came to mind was, okay, well, let's just say I buried alive in this, and buried alive is two generic, one black. You can put up to three creatures from your library into your graveyard, up to. So it, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna do Spellseeker, Thassa's Oracle. Spellseeker, Thassa's Oracle. I can use Arami now to exile uh, cards from my graveyard equal to the number of opponents. So I have to have had at least a, a threshold of three other cards in my graveyard, so five total, to go ahead and Buried Alive can go towards that total count. So if I had a Ponder and a Brainstorm, likely, in my graveyard, Buried Alive, whoop, all of those, allow me to give Encore to Spellseeker. Oh, what do I do? What do I do with Spellseeker? Well, everyone plays Spellseeker, and there's a good reason why. It finds Demonic Consultation, Tainted Pack, maybe some countermeasures. Well, in this instance, since we already have Thassa's Oracle in our graveyard, I can just use Spellseeker to the three copies I have to find, I don't know, Pact of Negation, Reanimate, and Demonic Consultation. That sounds good. What if I already have one of these things in my hand? I can just find an alternative form of counter, an alternative form of removal if there's something on the board stopping me from going off. And what's really cool about this particular effect is that it does skirt around certain abilities, certain stacks pieces that don't allow you to interact with your graveyard, like Grafdicker's Cage. Obviously, reanimating Thassa's Oracle, Grafdicker's Cage stops that, but you're allowed to use Encore on something else. I'm getting, I'm getting way off topic here. Basically, you're gonna wanna use Reanimate on Thassa's Oracle after, uh, and then after which trigger on the stack, Demonic Consultation. Is that how you win? Is that, is that how you're doing it? Cool, so you can do that. I think there's mirror mad loops with this. There's other things you can do with this. All of which are really cool. Dread Return will be in this list, sure, right? Dread Return lets you sacrifice three creatures to bring a creature back from your graveyard. So if you use mirror mad, mirror mad is, I forget its total casting cost, but uh, one of our Patreon members uses this card in a Scarab God list. Shout out to you. But essentially you can use one generic, one blue to put mirror mad into your deck and because it's a token, it doesn't exist in your deck, and then you can look through your list for another card called Mirror Mad, something like that. You And then if you don't find it, you put all your library into your graveyard. I'm very horribly paraphrasing this, but a Mirror Mad should be on the screen. You put your graveyard, your library into your graveyard, you have Dread Return, you kill Arami, you kill the other two copies of Mirror Mad, you get Thassa's Oracle, right? So it's a one-card combo, kind of. You have Dread Return in there too, but... 
I don't know, is that enough food for thought? I, I missed a combo last week, so I'm trying not to miss any combos this week. Otherwise, people are gonna impress me with their smartness. You, mm, yeah, you, you, you forgot one Arami combo. I'm like, I don't give a shit about Arami. But yeah, there you go. Uh, easily the coolest multicolored commander from this set. And I was gonna mention another multicolored card, but this card is just shit. After talking about Arami, Thassa's Oracle, that doesn't compete. I was gonna talk about Bella Borka, but no, no, that ain't worth talking about. We're gonna move on to colorless now. Colorless. So we've got Jeweled Amulet, or Jeweled Amulet, Jeweled Lotus out of the way. <laughs> Not comparable. Jeweled Lotus is extremely good. Don't need to mention that again. I'm gonna use that as a background image. It's that good. You get to see the card twice. Not Mana Crypt good, but good. Commander's Plate for one generic artifact equipment equipped creature gets plus three plus three and has protection from each color that's not in your commander's color identity. I don't know what that means for partners. Right? Equipped commander is three, equip is five. So if it's equipped to a monocolored commander like Teshar, you would have protection from blue, black, red, green, right? That's pretty good because I don't end, you know, that's probably really good for Teshar because none of the removal I'm expecting or interaction is going to be in white. So I think this is going to be extremely favorable for mono white lists. Like your Heliod list is going to maybe care about this. Not really. Teshar really would care about this. And Balan, you remember that deck. Balan really cares about this, by the way. Balan can attach equipment to itself and is in mono white. So if I attach Commander's Plate to Balan, Balan is not only getting plus three, plus three, and soon to have double strike, it's also getting protection from any color that's not in your color identity. I assume this means the color of the commander it's attached to, not the color identity of your list. So if you have a partner pairing that's Timna and Rograk, and Rograk has Commander's Plate attached to it, I would assume it has protection from white, black, blue, green. I assume. I could be wrong. I don't know. There's no official rules for this yet. Commander's Plate, really solid. Really cool piece of equipment. Is it for every list? Hell no. Right? It's no, it's no Jeweled Lotus. But it's certainly not Mana Crypt. Mana Crypt's for every list. Commander's Plate, really good protection. You know, outside of swords that are far more common in combo list. Um, particular Feast and Famine. Green and black protection is pretty solid. The last card I want to talk about is War Room. I, I don't know, I don't think I missed this, but I, I remember people talking about it last week and maybe I did miss it. War Room, it, it taps for a generic and you can pay three generic, tap it, pay life equal to the number of colors in your commander's color identity. Draw a card. So, just like Jeweled Lotus is a boon for mono and dual colored lists, this is a boon for mono and dual colored lists because this draw, unlike Bonder's Enclave, unlike Arch of Araska, which are other lands that let you draw cards pending conditions, this is a very easy condition to meet. As a matter of fact, you don't need to meet any condition. You just need to have a commander deck with war room in it. And when you use this, you'll only lose life equal to your commander's color identity so if you're in a mono color list you only lose one life while paying three to draw a card that's pretty good especially if your list relies on various top deck tutors so anything between like the vampiric tutor the enlightened tutor the sylvan tutor every color has a top deck tutor except for red except for red no they've got goblin top deck tutors regardless drawing a card for three generic when a game is like at a standstill despite the common belief that Commander is a turn three format, it, it can turn into a slog and very often, okay? Speed does not equate to the competitive aspect of Commander. Speed just happens to be what is typically played in Commander. But if the game drags on, War Room is going to be excellent for your list. And again, it's more of a boon for the mono or dual colored list because they can get away with having a land that taps for generic. I would not encourage you play this in a three to four to five colored list. Maybe three tops if your list just happens to be lacking draw. But War Room, really excellent on the off chance you need more draw. And that'll do it. That is week two of Commander Legends. That is the whole set spoiled. 
I would love to know your thoughts on all the cards mentioned between last week and this week. Obviously, if there's anything I missed that you find competitively viable or something that you're playing, let me know in the comment section down below. I'd love to know what combos I might have missed and I'm never going to talk about because we're done talking about this set. That's not entirely true. There's going to be a lot of footage regarding this product because it happens to be the first commander-centric draft set. So I'm hoping to get some content over on CFB regarding this set. And I'm very highly encourage you to watch that once it comes out. A lot of time is going to be spent on editing those videos for them. But I'd love to know your thoughts on this product. Are you happy with the reprints? Are you happy with some of the new cards that were announced? Do you think this is going to be the perfect draft set? Or will it also be a good set for bolstering your commander arsenal? Do you find that there's a lot of singles in here that are going to be good for your competitive play or, or not really? To me, it, it seems like they've dummied down the power of, of a lot of the legendaries, which is fine. You know, nothing is really inherently broken. I think raw Rack is arguably the best partner because you just do broken things with having a legendary on the field. Like those commander spells, being able to cast Deflecting Swat for free on turn one is really excellent. Being able to activate your Mox Amber automatically is really excellent. So Rog Rack is easily the, the best partner commander in my opinion. Um, but expect a deck tech from this set from me. And of course, expect some content regarding this set in a draft setting from me over on channel Fireball. But to end this video, guys, if you appreciate the content I put out and you like my insight on new products and you enjoy the content that is provided here, the best way to help support this show is via Patreon. And as our Brute Babies and Brute Crew members know, uh, there are a ton of benefits that come coupled with that. And you just need to visit the Patreon link in the description down below to figure out what all of those are. And before we get to the monthly topic, I'm gonna do a special shout out to one random Patreon member. And that Patreon member is Quirk. Quirk, thank you for being a brew baby. You are among the best. And for his thoughts on the monthly topic, I turn the mic over to Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew Mucky, and my thoughts on the topic of November is that I fear that if you ban something in CEDH, it's gonna just be played for some time in the normal EDH pods with less optimized decks, and they won't necessarily have the answers for it nearly as much as they would in a CEDH pod, making pretty much it more frequent to see stompers appear. Like they come in, they assemble their combo, it goes off, and you know, the game's over by turn three, where it's supposed to be quite a enjoyable game and casual, they're not trying to play as optimally as possible. So yeah, it's just, that's why I think a unified ban list is the way to go, and if we're going to ban something, ban it outright for everyone. That'll do it for this video, and in case you are wondering, yes, I am brewing for some of these partners, and likely the most chaotic list I've ever brewed came in the pairing of Rograk and Timna, and I cannot wait to share that Mardu list with you here. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and happy brewing, babies.